beginning there was no restoration, uh, uh, he was not restored in his property. He was not given back. Uh, the uh, communist uh, party regime wa wanted to give him back, but he had to pay a high fee. And so he decided not to buy it back, finally. And it was only uh, given back uh, to his family in the 1990s, finally. The second example is the department store zum Römischen Kaiser. Today, you can see it still on the Anger. It's the Anger 1. Perhaps you've already seen it. This, the large department store, which was too the most modern department store in Erfurt, was founded at the beginning of the 20th century by Siegfried Pintus. You can see painting of Pintus here, <coughs> and Arthur Arntheim. I have no painting of him. <laughs> and so um, it was a uh, ma very important uh, department uh, store. The customers were mainly people from the upper, uh, the higher classes, middle classes. And uh, so there was already uh, in the 1920s a rivalry with the other merchants. And uh, finally, Uh, in 1937, the, uh, um, the, uh, both uh, Arntheim uh, and Pintus were forced to sell uh, their uh, shop to, uh, uh, to a German, uh, to a Nazi, I would say. The background of uh, this policy here is uh, twofold. The one is this policy of the Nazis, the other is the rivalry of the small merchants who wanted to get rid of uh, this uh, concurrent, uh, with, of this uh, rival. And so the small merchants wanted uh, this department store to be closed. But uh, the uh, Nazis, which uh, did buy this uh, department store, did take it over and changed nothing. They ran it uh, and continued to rent it. And so The only thing they changed was the advertisement. You can see here an advertisement, and here down is written Arisches Geschäft, Aryan Shop. It's the only thing which was changing. Eh? Mm -hmm. So, this department store was not given back to the uh, family. Uh, but there was, uh, they paid, the actual owner uh, paid uh, uh, in compensation in the 1990s. You are not all visiting Tafensöne Friday, so, but I recommend to visit it. This is really important. Before you see, yeah. Yeah, go further on, uh, what's the Nordic Kristallnacht here? So, uh, the Kristallnacht, so the pogrom in uh, 1938. Yeah. They uh, destroyed uh, the uh, synagogue. I can sh show you later a picture of this old synagogue and we'll talk about it later. And on. also many shops? Uh, I have, yes, so they imprisoned mainly uh, the uh, male members of the Jewish community. And they brought them to Buchenwald. They were there at Buchenwald for several weeks and months. Uh, the idea was to force them to leave the, the, the to leave Germany. They, they mainly destroyed uh, uh, the synagogue. I have no evidence uh, concerning destroying of shops. That may might be possible, but I don't know about this. Um, and so uh, this was the end of the first period of this uh, policy, uh, uh, anti-Semitic policy concerning uh, which uh, well, the aim was to force the uh, Jews to leave Germany. And uh, later, in, from 1939 or 1940, began uh, the policy, the second period, uh, which was finally the Holocaust, to kill all the Jews. Huh? And this uh, enterprise, Top von Söhne, played a crucial part, a crucial role in this uh, policy because they contracted the ovens for uh, the uh, uh, crematories of uh, concentration camps like Buchenwald. So you will visit Buchenwald? Yes, yes. yes. And you can see there uh, the uh, crematory. 
uh, and the symbols of Topfenzöne. And they uh, constructed also uh, the uh, ovens for the crematories in uh, um, Auschwitz-Birkenau. But they did not only construct such ovens, <laughs> they uh, developed plants of ovens uh, which, in which uh, they were able to uh, uh, burn thousands of corpses one day. So they made this policy, they made the, sh uh, the show up possible on the technical, technical level. And uh, so uh, this, uh, the engineers working in this enterprise were no Nazis. They were simple engineers interested uh, to, uh, uh, to find a resolution uh, for a technical problem. This was it. Uh, okay. And so if you have the possibility to go to Toffensuna, go there. It's really important. It's interesting. It's an important uh, part of the history. But by the way, one, one of the family members of Toffensuna is now in the conference here. Okay, okay, <laughs> Hartmut, he's, he's, Hartmut Topf. Uh, yes, he's, yes. He's, yes. He's, he's not popular in the rest of the family. I yes, I know, <laughs> no, because uh, the rest of the family is denying the participation uh, uh, at the Holocaust. We, the, in this exposition uh, today, we, can, we are presenting documents uh, which are showing that they knew what they were doing. They knew that we are participating. Uh, yes, participating at a mass murder. Okay. Um, let's go on with the uh, history uh, uh, after the <laughs> Second World War. In 1945, um, so settled once more Jews, 15 Jews uh, which uh, survived the extermination camps here in Alpha. Members of the old Jewish community in Alpha. And together with uh, other Jewish families coming from uh, Breslau, from Silesia, they founded a new commu community. So most of them went away after a short period here, uh, after a short stay. They went to the States or to Israel. But a part stayed here, uh, founded a new community, and uh, they constructed a new synagogue, which is still existing, in 1950, 1952, on the place where the old, the large synagogue had been standing. Uh, and so uh, this is the only synagogue constructed in the GDR. Um, in 1951, uh, new persecutions began uh, because Stalin uh, accused the Jews uh, that they are working with the capitalists, with uh, the imperialists. New persecutions began uh, and uh, Jews were accused, uh, some sentenced to death. And so the most of the members of the Jewish community left uh, um, the GDR we went to Israel out of the States too. But uh, some stayed here and in the 1990s there was still existing a Jewish committee of 25 members. And it was only in the 1990s when the frontiers was opened, we opened that uh, new members of the Jewish committee was, were settling here, mostly from Russia. And today uh, this uh, Jewish committee have 800 members, which is still existing still using this, you know. Okay, this was... Is that enough for a new program? I don't, no new program. <laughs> no, no. So, is that almost the same number as was here in the 30s? Did you say 800? Yes, yes. No, the almost 30s. the same number, you can say, yes. yes. Okay. A kind of a victory. Yeah. Yes, you can say. The <laughs> looks authentically old, like the rubric here through the world. I have played with you left here today. You already have seen, I imagine, that you uh, uh, that you have a lot of ancient buildings in the town because in the Second World War there were only 7% of the houses destroyed by bombs. And so it's one of the best preserved towns in the whole Germany we have here. And uh, so uh, here we have a quarter mainly from the 16th century uh, because uh, large parts of the town had been destroyed by a fire in the late 15th century and uh, this part had to be reconstructed. But uh, we have uh, still other 
older buildings on the left side you can see medieval buildings and parts of this building just behind me uh, are going back to uh, the 12th century so we had to find uh, timber the tree was cut in the 12th century inside this building and here when we go down we will enter now into uh, in the uh, old medieval Jewish quarter let's go there We were coming now back to the Jewish quarter. And this Jewish quarter is beginning here. And it's going down till you know, the other side of the town hall. Because this Jewish quarter is in the center of the town. We met down there, it's at the side of the Merchant's Bridge. It's just at the side of the town. And so you can see, it shows the importance of uh, this uh, Jewish community for the development, for the economic development of the town. Um, but it's not the only case. In Worms, for example, the Jewish quarter had been settled just at the side of the cathedral. Okay, but this Jewish quarter is uh, no ghetto. Here in this quarter, for the first community in, in any case, um, uh, this is too, in this quarter with Jews and Christians living side by side. And uh, so it's beginning here, it's going down there. On the right side we have the old synagogue um, and uh, then uh, we have other institutions of the Jewish community here like the Mikve, uh, we have uh, a house, a dance house for the Jewish community and so uh, we can go the, down there now to this place. All So, uh, this place is called St. Benedict's place because here was standing a church at the entry of the street. I was standing a church, this was uh, St. Benedict's church. And so the uh, Jewish border was inside the limits of this parish. And uh, this uh, Jewish community is, was growing. Uh, we know this because uh, the priest of St. Benedict uh, was complaining in 1240 that this Jewish community is growing and so he has heavy losses of income because the members of the, the, the Christian parish had to pay fees uh, for burials, for marrying, uh, baptisms and so on. And with diminishing the members uh, of uh, the uh, Christian uh, parish so he losses his fees. And so he uh, wants to uh, have some compensation and the Jews had to pay for him this compensation. Then, uh, later, some years later, in 1248, uh, the community was uh, uh, buying, no, was constructing a building for the community where they could gather. So, uh, normally, uh, the community was gathering in the synagogue. Here in Erfurt, we have a special building, and we can go there now, where this building was. It was the dance house. In the 13th century, the parish hall. So, uh, building for the gathering of the Jewish community, the dance house. Another institution we had, eventually the Mikrovil pass later there, uh, and uh, we had here a cemetery. This cemetery was outside the town, uh, just uh, in the north of the town, in front of the uh, uh, town wall. So Jewish cemetery were not inside the town, they were from the Middle Ages on, they were outside the town. And so we had all these different institutions, and uh, this community was a full community, it was a kehila. And not every community had such a symmetry. Um, uh, so members of other communities in Thuringia uh, had to come here to Alfred to bury the dead here in the cemetery of, uh, of Alfred. And this shows this really large importance of uh, the community in Alfred.
Um, so, uh, and the situation, the living conditions here in the 13th century, uh, so they are between uh, acceptance, integrations, and persecution. So, in uh, 1303, there was another pogrom, but uh, six years later, in 1309, the Jews, the Jewish community was participating at defending uh, the town when it was besieged by the uh, German emperor. So you can see that the, the, both things. They had been integrated. Uh, the uh, Jews, uh, the Jewish community had a certain privilege here. They had not to uh, wear Jewish symbols like the yellow uh, circle or Jewish hat. They had the privilege not to wear this semblance. And they were per persecuted. And finally, we had the large pogrom in 1349. On the 21st May of 1349, the whole Jewish community had been killed to persecute in a large pogrom. Why this? So we have, we can see different reasons why uh, they organized this pogrom. The first was the arrival of the Black Death in Europe in some years earlier. And so uh, thousands of people died, of course, uh, because of this epidemic. They didn't know the reasons for this. And so accused the Jews to have poisoned the wells. And so uh, they searched, they were looking for a responsible. They accused the Jews. And there had been a wave of pogroms all over in Western Central Europe. And here in Africa too, in 1349. So you have to say that the Black Death only arrived here one year later, in 1350. And uh, this uh, shows us. Oh, they're loud. <laughs> this shows us um, some other reasons. Uh, and uh, inside the uh, town had been a conflict, uh, heavy conflict between two parties, which were fighting for power in the town council. And one of those two parties organized uh, the pogrom in order to obtain the power. The town council uh, wanted to suppress this uh, um, pogrom, um, but was not successful. And so in this day, the whole community was killed. 100 uh, persons died uh, when they were defending uh, the quarter against the attacks of the Christians. The other died in uh, the buildings which the Jews themselves did, uh, had set in fire. So they wa didn't want to fall in the head of their hands of their enemies. They did set uh, the, uh, uh, the houses in fire and they died all in the fire. And so after this, uh, after this pogrom, for several years, no more uh, Jewish community was existing here in the town. In 1354, Several Jewish families came back. The town council invited them to come here, to settle here. And they did two, two important things. They constructed for the new Jewish community, for the second Jewish community, a new synagogue. Because the old already had been sold to the two merchants. I will tell you this later. And they constructed a new synagogue. And they constructed for the, this new community uh, apartment buildings. Parts of this apartment building I can show you now. Let's go there. 